Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this Concurrence broadcast. Now, today I'm delighted to be speaking to Giuseppe Colangelo. So, Giuseppe, let's start by uh, telling our audience a bit about what work you're doing and, and what you're finding very interesting at the moment. Uh, thank you much, Jennifer, for having me. Uh, well, I'm a competition law and economics professor, and I usually run research around uh, regulation, antitrust, and obviously in recent years, yeah, there, um, this kind of research is mainly focused on digital platform and digital economy in general. So uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, intriguing issues that are coming out from different perspectives and from diff different geographical areas. So it's a pretty interesting and challenging topic to discuss about antitrust in digital economy. Well, today we're going to focus in on the question of fairness. Now, I mean, fairness can mean a lot of things depending on the sector you're looking at or whether you're viewing it from the point of view of a consumer or whether you're viewing it from the point of view of a legal perspective or even just a sort of an interested party. What do you understand by the meaning of fairness or what, how do you contextualize it? The meaning of fairness actually is the question about fairness because I guess that no one is able to say what fairness means. I mean that if uh, this is a question that has been raised not just nowadays as a, let's say a traditional question, probably we have a, uh, the time to discuss about it in a while. Uh, but the main problem with fairness when it comes to uh, use it as a standard for the evaluation of practice and conduct in the market is that actually fairness means different type of things. And it's difficult to find peoples that agree on this very same definition of fairness. Um, so it's pretty uh, hard to uh, find, let's say in economic terms, a threshold that allow us to understand when something is fair or is unfair, okay? Because at some point uh, when it comes, for instance, to terms and conditions, to prices, you have to define when a price is unfair. It means that it has to, uh, but to be above a specific threshold. And so first of all, it's difficult to understand the meaning of fairness. Second of all, uh, that is quite related is that uh, fairness for whom? I mean that we have different stakeholders that are involved in, in the market and not necessarily we may are able to ensure a sort of Pareto optimal solution that everyone are better off. So. When it comes to fairness, it means that you always have to strike a sort of trade-off because probably if you want to protect someone against an alleged unfair, unfair practice, it means that you decide to choose which kind of stakeholder, consumers, business users, uh, competitors, and so on and so forth, you want to treat and to protect against alleged unfair practice. So actually, when it comes to market at all and maybe we have the chance to discuss in digital markets but when it comes to markets all the main difficulty with fairness as a north star of our uh, analysis is that no one actually knows what fairness means and who are we going to protect when we um, think about fairness well i think obviously you've identified the problem there and one of the areas I want to dig into a little bit is we hear friend terms uh, bandied about very often as a phrase, so fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. Do you think that is uh, in a way helpful to, when, we, when we put the word fair in with that? Because is it easier to define non-discriminatory or is it easier to define reasonable than it is to define fair? Uh, well, that's a, a very interesting point because uh, let's say that in the antitrust enforcement we experienced in the past, some areas where fairness has been applied. And one of, the, of these areas is definitely the standard essential patent scenario. Um, because we know that uh, holders of such patents are subject to friend licenses obligation. Uh, uh, these uh, commitments is um, aimed at addressing all that concerns. And so standard setting organization typically require uh, SAP holders to submit frank commitments. Uh, that means that the goal is to make the, these patents available at a price equivalent 
to what patents uh, would have been worth in the market prior to the time they were declared as censure. However, whether Frank Committee can effectively prevent SEP owners from imposing excessive royalties obligation on licensee is a very debated issue. Uh, this is again mainly because because of the unclear meaning of the friend acronym. Uh, in fact, there are no generally agreed upon tests to determine whether a particular license does satisfy a friend commitment. Uh, so again, uh, probably uh, we have a stronger consensus of the second leg of the commitment, the non-discriminatory one. But when it comes to fair slash reasonable, um, after a couple of decades of litigation and case law on standard essential pattern, we are unable to know when a licensee, when a royalty is fair or is not fair. We are unable even to agree whether there is just one royalty that is fair or when a royalty should be declared fair if it is between a range of value. Because for instance, usually in the US scenario, the friend has been defined as a sort of dot, just a point. So there is just one royalty that is friend. In the EU, EU case law, we usually rely on a range uh, that is a minimum and maximum amount um, among with the royalty may be defined friend. But the problem is that ex ante, we are unable to predict uh, when a royalty is firm and reasonable and where is not them. That's the reason why in, in SAP uh, case law, we have a huge worldwide litigation. Moving uh, a little bit, we talked about standard essential paths, but taking the digital sector in general, if you like, or digital, uh, let's look at say marketplace, let's look at the digital platforms. Do you see fairness as a particularly thorny issue for this sector? And is that in any way linked to the fact that we often talk about how we have, you know, a, a duopoly or, or you know, or, or several companies that are inherently dominant in the space? And does that pose particular problems for, for the digital sector? Yeah, well, uh, let's say that within the uh, lively debate originated by the emergence of digital markets and platform business model, uh, a peculiar role has been devoted to fairness as a, a sort of guiding principle. Um, and this is particularly apparent in the EU, uh, where recent legislative initiative explicitly declared to aim at promoting fairness in the digital economy. Um, let's say that fairness is also invoked as a sort of cure for bigness against the what is perceived as an undue corporate power and market concentration. Um, and so such request is essentially invoked against what have been defined as gatekeeper. Um, large online company that have a gatekeeping position, uh, which allow them to exert a bottleneck or intermediation power vis-a-vis -vis business user. Um, let's say that's serving as an important gateway for business user to reach and user. This platform often represent unavoidable trade partners, and so they may exploit their superior bargaining power uh, by imposing unfair contracting terms and condition. Uh, moreover, they usually perform a dual role, uh, being uh, simultaneously intermediaries and traders operating on their own platform. So they may have an incentive to self-prefer, that means to discriminate to their own benefits. And let's say overall risk uh, generated by the imbalance of bargaining power and conflict of interest adding at induce some uh, policymaker and legislator to introduce uh, or envisage provision aimed at assuring an even playing field, neutralizing the competitive advantage of large intermediation platform. According to this, this line of reasoning, big techs are required to treat fairly uh, rivals, uh, guests on the platform. Uh, this is a sort of uh, neutrality principle. They are supposed to be neutral and so to treat fair both rivals and other guests on the platform. So from this point of view, uh, fairness uh, has become part of the debate of the role of competition poll in the digital economy. And uh, it has been used also to question the consumer welfare standard in order to justify a more aggressive intervention. The claim is that ignoring the many goals of antitrust law, 
systematically biased antitrust toward under enforcement. Um, and so uh, fairness is used together as together with other goals of social goals and ethical goals of antitrust laws, such as labor protection, wealth inequalities, sustainability, to promote, let's say, a wider um, and a more extensive approach and enforcement of antitrust rules against the, let's say, the pure efficiency-oriented Chicago school approach. That 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 would say that the, I would say this is the background uh, in which the fairness is located in, in this debate. And to build on that, how do you see that impacting consumers? When we think about uh, perhaps the, the relationship of a consumer vis-a-vis -a, -vis a huge platform, um, I'm thinking even perhaps of the sort of dark patterns that lead consumers to click, I agree, I agree, or things like cookie fatigue. I mean, do we see fairness creeping into any discussions around the relationship between digital businesses and their customers? Uh, well, you are right. I mean, that uh, we may decline fairness in different ways. Uh, apparently, so far, the term is, has been essentially used to, let's say, to protect the business user. I mean, that if you look at Europe, uh, the platform to, be, uh, platform to Business Regulation, the DMA, and also the Data Act, um, aimed at uh, introducing fairness in business relationship rather than specifically in customer platform relationship. Uh, then again, you may imagine a sort of fairness standard in the relationship between platform and consumers. If you look at, for instance, at the German Facebook case, which was related to the fact that, um, let's say that the, the terms and conditions that the social network uh, may impose on consumer without allowing them to select different uh, option when they are um, using the social network may undermine like, what they define their digital identity because they are not completely free to um, protect their data, to, free to engage with the social network, so on and so forth. But uh, the main problem is that, um, again, it's difficult to understand whether we need the antitrust law to intervene whether it is sufficient to deal with this type of different issue with just contract law. Um, because again, uh, it is different if we complain about the fairness in terms of unclear terms and conditions that makes the counterparty not completely aware or free about what he is going to sign. And when it comes to fairness instead about the uh, unbalance of bargaining power uh, that is horizontal, I mean, is mainly related to the relationship between undertaking. And so you want to create a level playing field in order to allow business uh, rivals and partners to better strike deal against a larger company. And again, um, we should understand whether we, we decline, we interpret fairness as just the way in which uh, something is unclear, and so is, it means more transparency on when it is fairness interpreted in a way of contractual fairness, so the imbalance of bargaining power, or even unfairness of market outcomes. That means something different. It means that you are complaining about, let's say, the structure of the market, the fact that there are few companies, and you want to pursue a different uh, scenario in terms of market outcomes. So in our discussion, in very few minutes, we, we do understand that at least there are three different meanings of fairness. Transparency, that probably is better interpreted in the relationship between cons consumers and platform or undertakings in general. Um, contractual fairness, that is mainly related to the relationship and bargaining relationship between undertakings. And then there could be also a claim in terms of fairness of our market outcome. This, this means three different things. Uh, well, indeed, as you say, very complex. And we're focusing mainly on competition law. But of course, here in Europe, when it comes to digital, we've got some new laws coming in. We've got the DSA and the DMA, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. 
do you have any input on whether you think those are going to have an impact in this area or or any predictions for what you might see in terms of a change in enforcement or a change in the burden on, if you like, enforcement authorities and how they manage the, the problems they face in defining fairness? Uh, well, uh, let's say that in the DMA we have, uh, in the final version of the DMA, not in the first one, but in the final version of the DMA, we have a definition of fairness. Uh, and, um, and probably I will come uh, on this uh, just in a sec, but to answer uh, at, uh, to your question, well, these type of interventions, especially the DMA, actually are aimed at easing the enforcement. I mean, when it comes to DMA, we know that uh, there is no need for the enforcer to find the dominance. Uh, no need to demonstrate, to show, to define the market, the relevant market. Uh, there are no room for efficiency defense. So in terms of enforcement, this is a very convenient shortcut because you are skipping, you're avoiding all the antitrust analysis. So you, when a company is designated uh, as a gatekeeper, you do not need to demonstrate that this domin that has a dominant position. There is no need to uh, define relevant market, and the company is unable to defend uh, itself, showing uh, pro-competitive efficiency. So, if we are looking at just um, at this intervention from the perspective of the enforcement, well, these these are a, a very powerful shortcut because again. Um, when the practice is within the list of the MA, it is forbidden. Then it won't be so easy, I guess, because um, due to the fact that several of these practices are very narrowly defined, uh, we will have a probably used discussion about the possibility to enforce that specific practice because probably the other the company will say, well, actually, my practice, my strategy does not necessarily match the one that you list in the DMA. That's one of the concern about the way in which DMA has been structured. Um, however, when it comes to the, the fairness uh, guiding principle, when in DMA, uh, the fairness is not only mentioned in the title of the intervention, but we have also a definition that try to distinguish fairness and contestability. And in particular, um, there is an interpretation of fairness as a sort of protection against the asymmetric negotiation power in order to ensure a sort of uh, adequate sharing of the surplus among the actors that uh, um, among the actors that play around and within the platform. However, even in DMA, uh, there is a specific recital when it is stated that uh, contestability and fairness are intertwined. It means that an obligation may address both. Uh, this makes confusion. Indeed, uh, the DMA does not list the obligation according to the specific goal they are to pursue, to, to pursue. It does not clarify which obligation is aimed at a safeguarding contestability and which obligation is aimed at safeguarding or promoting fairness. Uh, this happened despite of the fact that the title of the chapter three of the DMA refers to practice of gatekeeper that limited contestability or are unfair. If we look at the article, we are unable to understand which practice um, is aimed to protect contestability and which practice is able to, con to protect fairness. But again, as DMA find an easy um, way to avoid this risk, contestability and fairness are intertwined. But when they are intertwined, it means that you run the risk of creative confusion. When it comes to contestability, it means that we are not complaining about the unbalance of bargaining power. We are complaining about entry barriers and the fact that newcomers are unable to effectively compete and enter into market and make them contestable with the, against the incumbent. So apparently contestability and fairness means different things. Unfortunately, the DMA, uh, even if it introduced uh, a definition, does not allow us to understand which kind of practice are, are 
going to tackle contestability and which are going to tackle fairness. And so the confusion is still on, on the table. And if I may say that, um, the confusion is functional, I would say, to this intervention. Um, I mean, the, the, the very revival of fairness is functional to provide policymakers with more rooms for intervention by revealing them from the hurdles of economic analysis. So the very competitive advantage of the fairness is that you do not have a definition. And if you do not have a strict economic definition, you have more destruction, discretion as enforcer. And so probably we, we won't expect more, uh, more clarity about fairness because actually enforcer uh, get a huge advantage to rely on a label when no one may question actually what it means because they have more room to intervene. I would say that the very same problem is in the US debate when it comes to competitive process. There are scholar and policy makers that are going to tell, well, the antitrust law should protect competitive process. If you compare competitive process and fairness, you have the same problem. What does it mean competitive process? And again, the concern is that you are advancing labels that are enough vague to leave enforcer the possibility to actually do whatever they want. And that's not so good from the, let's say, from the legal point of view and also from the fact that undertaking should have the chance to understand in advance what it is illegal uh, in terms of practice and strategy and not just to discover it ex post. Well, indeed, but as so often happens with EU law, a lot of this does come down to how we see it in practice and finding out that these laws are actually having to be fought through the courts before we really know what they mean. Yeah. It's, a, it's an ongoing problem. I think we're not going to solve it here in today's podcast. But I will ask you one final question, which is whether you've got any advice for our audience, for those listening, uh, particularly if they are from the C-suite or indeed if they're compliance officers or, or legal representatives trying to work out where to go next with their approach to fairness? How should we be thinking about it going forward? Uh, well, I guess that the uh, main success of fairness, probably also in the future, is related to the unbalance of bargaining power. And if we are talking to uh, European audience, uh, I would say that one of the main concerns that who is working in this field should uh, take into account, they should address, is also the so-called abuse of economic dependence. I mean that in EU, we know that we are going to deal with the DMA sooner. Uh, however, the DMA, uh, we know that is not uh, completely taking over antitrust law. So people that are working in this field know that probably has to deal with both the DMA and antitrust law, okay? And the risk of duplication of intervention at national level and the European level. So there is a risk that the very same practice and strategy may be tackled under the DMA and under antitrust law, because this is not forbidden, okay? Uh, due to the fact that DMA is proclaimed as to be different from antitrust law. Within the antitrust provision, the provision that may be uh, used most by national antitrust authority could be the abuse of economic dependence. That is a specific provision aimed at addressing the uneven bargaining uh, power, uh, so the uneven level playing field. Um, and is actually an antitrust provision because it belongs to, in, in several member states, it belongs to antitrust law. So for national antitrust authority that actually are losing uh, tools, uh, enforcement tools, because of the DMA, because the DMA is a centralized uh, model, so it's essentially based on the enforcement by the European Commission. Well, um, I would suggest to take also a look at the nation, the, the new and the old national antitrust provision on the economic dependence, because actually when it comes to fairness, and apparently uh, the European competition policy is devoted to tackle fairness in the digital economy. Well, when it comes to fairness, the abuse of economic dependence has been built up 
in the last two decades around the fairness of term recognition in business to business relationship. So that's something I will take um, deeply into account. Well, Giuseppe, thank you very much for talking to us today and thank you to our audience for your attention. This very complicated, complex and sometimes confusing issue of fairness. Remember to stay tuned for more episodes of Concurrence, your antitrust podcast. Bye.